already done for the healings that have taken place, for the blessings that have gone forth already by your spirit. We receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Everybody say praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. The hand clap. The work. I don't know if I got a bad battery or what happened here, but my light's not lighting up. I'm trying to find light. That little light your... My little light won't shine. Oh, Come praise on. Praise the Lord. We'll, we'll try another sound. Bear with us, everybody. Praise the Lord. Technology is a wonderful thing. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Just a little loose connection there. Praise the Lord. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Tim, for opening. As always, did a great job. Suzanne and Peter leading us in worship, and everybody sharing your testimonies and prayer requests. It's always a great thing. Praise the Lord. And I am always amazed at how the Lord works because everything Tim was talking about is what I want to talk to you about tonight. Same with, Tom, uh, with uh, Don and Jane. His spirit bears witness with our spirit, and uh, amen. So it's good to have that witness out of two or three Amen. The matter's established, so praise God. What do you call an indecisive bee? Maybe. <laughs> you know, I used to have a photographic memory, but I never developed it, so. <laughs> so now I've got issues today. Praise the Lord. It has nothing to do with age. It just didn't develop the photographic thing. You know, it's hard to explain puns to kleptomaniacs. Because they always take things literally. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. A mean crook going downstairs is a condescending, condescending. <laughs> just, take a, just take a deep breath. Praise the Lord. Okay, in all seriousness, so I want to tell you about my grandfather. He was a good man. He was a brave man. He had the heart of a lion and a lifetime banned from the zoo. <laughs> the heart of a lion. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. God is good. Soup's on. And so let's move forward. I want to start out, Peter. I want to read uh, Psalms 27. And I'm going to read, it's 14 verses, but we'll read the whole thing. And uh, so Psalms 27, praise the Lord. And again, thank you all for sharing. It's great to see God, you know, bearing witness and, and uh, kind of confirming and helping us to understand that uh, the direction he's wanting, to, the Holy Spirit's trying to take us. Amen. So David writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should arise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now I want you to focus on this idea of the house of the Lord and what he's actually saying to us here. We know that we are the dwelling place of God. So this is more than just David randomly talking. He's speaking prophetically. He had an insight into what was going to come, amen, by Jesus, uh, this whole idea of us becoming the house of God rather than there being a structural edifice someplace for this. And so he says, this thing is I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And I'm going to say this in advance and I'll go back through it later. But what he's telling us here is, in the time of trouble he will hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle. This right here. He hides us, the real us, the spiritual us, the one that is like God. This outside thing, it, it, as we've all said already, it, it fails. It, it misses the mark. It's not, it's not like God. 
Amen. It just has access into this world. But what David is saying, in this thing, in this tabernacle, God's going to hide the real me. And that's what we have to be focused on. That's what we have to look for. And that's what David did. That's what, that's what David's life was about. Amen. And so shall, now shall, he shall set me up upon a rock. Amen. In the time of trouble, he'll hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. In this flesh, in this mess, I will offer up sacrifices of joy even when I'm not joyous or even when it doesn't, things don't look like there's anything to be joyous about. Amen. That's a sacrifice. So therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in plain path because of my enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies, but for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. That would be the devil. Amen. He comes to accuse the brethren constantly. He's always coming against us. He is our enemy. He is the only real enemy that we have. Amen. He manipulates people to where it looks like they're the enemy, but they're really not. They're just humans. Amen. Being controlled and, and, and used by the enemy. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. So the real you is hidden in this tabernacle. Amen. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. So how's God going to be our God? How's he going to be my God? He said, I will dwell in them, and I will be their God. So there's all kinds of stuff around us, and we know this every day. We're, we're bombarded by life, by the circumstances and situations and, and issues and, and stuff, praise the Lord. And they force us to notice them. You know, they, they try to capture your attention and get you to be all about whatever the thing is that's messing with you. You know, whatever the, the situation, the circumstance might be. Amen. It gets our attention, and, and yet, we don't really take it to heart. You know what I'm saying? It irritates us, it aggravates us, but it's not something we embrace, it's just something we have to deal with, right? Well, now, then there's this other, the other things that, uh, that actually take possession of our lives. Things like the children that we saw here this morning, grandchildren and children of our own when they're growing up, and great-grandchildren, and, and if you live long enough and all that. They actually possess your life. They actually become something that, that lives through you. Now, they have their own life, and they're independent and all that, but yet you can't disconnect, right? I mean, that, that's, that's a part of you. That's, that's something that you just cannot uh, disassociate yourself from, amen? And they become kind of voyeuristically, you live out through them too. You know, you, you try to give them things that you didn't have when you were a kid. Maybe you show affection that you didn't get, or you, you just do things, whatever, to try to embrace that relationship and make it even greater than what it, it might otherwise be. Amen? So, we just don't think uh, of our hearts being created so that God could actually dwell there. You understand what I'm saying? We, we understand that with our own, with our children and grandchildren and, and things that are, have tremendous value to us, we embrace that. They become a part of us. You can't disassociate. You can't disconnect. But it's hard for us for some reason to understand that, that God wants to do the same thing. Amen? He, he wants to show his life. He wants to show his love there. And so 
He does that so that our love and our joy might be in him. Nothing gives me more pleasure than to have I, the little one, Ivy. She'll follow me everywhere. I mean, she just, they spent the night with us uh, yesterday and last night. It's just popo, popo, popo. Every time I turn around, I got to walk, or I'll be stepping on her like the cat. You know, I mean, she's always right there. Just for, and as kind of aggravating as it might be at times, I, yet it gives me a great kick. You know, I mean, I think, geez, this kid really loves me, but she doesn't know me that well, praise the Lord. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's just, it, it warms your heart uh, with all of the kids. I mean, but she's young enough and just at the age where she's starting to verbalize a little bit. And so you're seeing this transition with her. The other kids, you know, they, I get a big kick out of them. I love being with them and hugging them and talking with them and so forth. But they're getting, they're, they're starting to grow, you know, and, and become a little more mature. But I mean, I, the thing that struck me is that this is what God wants. He, he wants that same feeling. This is what he created us for. Now, you can say, well, you're just being kind of naive. No, this is, this is the God that created us. He is our Father. We have his DNA. We have his, and he wants that to be expressed between him and us, between us personally and him. Amen? So I, we've got lots of grandkids. I don't even know. I've lost count to be quite honest, 28, okay, and uh, great-great-grandchildren, great eight great-grandchildren, and, uh, you know, we love all of them, but we love each one of them in a little bit different way, not more or less, but just differently, because they're each one different, right, I mean, you all know that with your own children, and you don't love one more than another one, but you, you love them in a different way, because you interact with them in a different way, just because of their personality, and you know how things work out. And this, that's what God means by this personal relationship. He doesn't love one person more than another, but the relationships are all unique based on how much we want to give him. That, that has a lot to do with how much we get back. I don't like to hug and love on a, a little kid that's uncomfortable with that. That's not good. I mean, not for me or for the kid or anybody else. And that's, I would love to have them be more, you know what I'm saying, demonstrative in the way that they respond, but some aren't and I get it. That's just okay. That's the way they are, you know? And so God is the same way with us, but how much more we get when we're willing to give, when we, when we want to show our love for him, how much more that love is then reflected back to us. And that's what God is really about. He wants, he wants to show his life and his love and, and so that our love can be full, so that our joy can be full. I mean, it ought to be, this relationship we have with God ought to be as natural as the love of our children and how it fills our hearts and makes us happy. That's what God wants our relationship with him to be about. This is where religion has gotten in the way and kind of messed it up because it's made us fearful of God rather than running to him and embracing him and, and expecting his love and his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace and, and his favor. We kind of do the side thing just in case he might be in a bad mood and we get that backhand or something, you know. We can absolutely have God in our hearts because that's what our hearts were made for. God living in us, filling us with his goodness and with his blessing. God wants your heart. And if you give it to him, he'll dwell in it. In other words, he'll become alive in it. Now he's there. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. But he's in a lot of people that for all practical purposes, he might as well be down the street somewhere because they're not interacting with it. They're not responding to his presence. They're not conscious of his presence. Amen. So they get very little benefit from that presence. Amen. Let's look at uh, Psalms 42 and verse 8, Peter. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Praise the Lord. So we had the kids yesterday, and uh, I was still working on stuff for today. Plus, I was trying to watch a little bit of the ball games, which was more disappointing than fun. But yeah, the kids are coming back and forth, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm thinking that, you know, during the daytime... I'm still loving them. You know, I, I'm not maybe devoting as much time as Sally was because they were up and down the stairs. I was upstairs doing what I was doing, and she was downstairs. And, uh, but I'd, you know, they'd come up once in a while, and I'd go down. Ivy was up there almost constantly. But, and I thought, you know, we, I'm letting them know I love them. You know, in other words, I'm commanding my love. I'm, I'm declaring my, my love, you know. And then at night, we got, they got ready to go to bed, and they all wanted a story. 
and so we all went into the bedroom because some of them slept in the bedroom, some slept in the living room and on air mattresses and so forth. And uh, so I was doing the Tom Sawyer thing and because uh, I loved to scare them <laughs> with the engine Joe in the cave and all that stuff. But anyway, Tom Sawyer's just gotten to be one of the books that I always read to him just because I like it. And uh, I thought this, then see at night, I didn't sing a song to him, but I read a story to him. You know, just, just to keep the intimacy. See, that's, and that's what God is saying here. Yes. I don't want, this is not about me, but I'm just seeing our lives like a metaphor sometimes in the way that God wants to interact with us and how we interact with those that are important to us that we care about. And that's what I was feeling through the whole thing. And my prayer under the God of my life. Psalms 43, verse 2. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Amen. Verse 4 and 5. The God of my strength. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto a God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. So I asked myself, how can God be my strength? How can he be the strength of my life? By coming into my life with his life and filling me with his strength. He said, I will dwell in them and I will be their God. That's the only way he can be your God. He can be God. But he can't be your God unless he's dwelling in you. Amen? He's the God of everything. He is the creator of all. People that accept him, people that don't accept him. But he's only your God if he dwells within you, if you have accepted him in that way. Amen? And so think of the difference it would make in our lives if we really believed this. Amen? And really responded to that presence. Just think of the blessings that flow. That's what David talks about over and over in the scripture. This is a guy with a lot of problems and a lot of issues, just like all of us. And yet he found that this pursuit of this God reality, amen, can take care of everything. It can handle every situation and circumstance. Believe me, he had circumstance. He was the king. I mean, there were wars to fight. There were assassination attempts within his own family and everything else. So there was a, it was a, a huge, huge battle. And he knew that it was through his pursuit of God a man after my own heart, God said. In other words, a man who wants this relationship, who wants to interact with me. Amen. So we were created by God for exactly this. Amen. That's our reason for existing. That's our reason for being. Amen. So that God could show and God could impart his goodness and his glory to us in a way that we could understand. The way we interact with our loved ones and so forth. That's what he's trying to get us to, to, to comprehend. He created us in his own image and in his likeness so that in us he could show that life of God could dwell in human beings. Praise the Lord. God wants to give us all that he has. Himself. Amen. And we're wanting the stuff and he says seek the kingdom of God first, his righteousness or his life or his way of doing things and the other stuff gets added. Now I'm not saying we shouldn't desire blessing and healing and so on and so forth. But see, if we have this intimate relationship with him, we know we've already got the answer to our prayer. He's already done it. And he is just releasing it. And by faith, we have it all. Amen. God wants to give us everything. He wants to give us him. Amen. Joy, love, strength, everything that life requires, everything God was in himself in heaven living out his own life there, his eternal life in heaven, he wants to be the same thing on earth in and through us. That was the reason for creating Adam, and that was the reason for the new birth or to be born again so that we could experience this again, amen, as God initially and originally intended it. I will dwell in them, amen. God made man to be his home. Praise the Lord. See, the temptation that Satan brought uh, to man in the garden was to get man to hold back his whole heart. In other words, not to completely trust God, but, you know, maybe some of the things he's doing is okay, some of the things not so. 
instead of recognizing God as Father and God, man would instead self-rule, more conscious of his own thoughts and intents than God's. Amen? He'd be the master of his own house, the God of his own temple. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. He says, and who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So what he's saying is the nature of self, the old Adamic nature, sits in the temple of God as if he were God. Are you with me? This is the temple. But if I don't acknowledge that God is here, then I become the God of the temple. And now it's all up to me. I worship myself basically as though I were God. The problem is then I've got to provide everything that God otherwise would be willing to provide. God won't do it if I think I'm going to do it. If it's about me and my abilities, then God just stands back and waits for me to wear myself out and get frustrated and fall on my face and let God be God again. Not because he's trying to punish me, he's just the only way I'm ever going to understand what God wants to do and what God can be in my life is to let him, to trust him. Amen? John 17, verse 21. That's why, you know, religion is such a complication when it comes to relationship with God. It always makes it about the rules. It always makes it about you instead of it being about him. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's the salvation that Jesus purchased for us. Amen? We are restored to the life we were created for, a home for God. Amen? Genesis 22, verse 17. And again, religion complicates it all. It just it adds all these other components that have nothing to do with it. This is just simply God wants to be here. He wants this to be his home. He wants to show himself mighty through this home. The same way he does in the temple. When, when there was a structural temple, he, when he would show up there, his glory would fill the place. People couldn't do anything. Why? Because they couldn't offer anything more than what God was able to do. And that's the lesson we're supposed to learn from if God is in us, his glory is here. It's not about me. It's about God. He fills the temple. I just get to be a recipient of all that comes as a result of that. Amen. So in Genesis twenty-two seventeen, 17, he says that in blessing, I will bless thee. This is God talking to Abraham, right? Now, Abraham was an old man. He couldn't have kids. His wife was barren, on and on and on. But this is the thing. He says that in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. So we know that Isaac was born as a result of the promise. He was the promised child. He was the supernatural birth, amen, from God. And uh, Ishmael was the result of man's work. Not, not trusting God, but just trying to be in charge yourself and figuring out some way to make this thing work, right? So then, the seed as the stars of the heaven here that he talks about is talking about Isaac. Amen? And the seed that is as the sand of the seashore is talking about Ishmael. Heaven and earth. Natural and supernatural. So the two natures are shown here. The heavenly and the earthly. The Christ nature and the Adamic nature. The heavenly and the fallen, right? So then, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is talking about when we sit in the temple of God, wanting our will instead of God's will. Thinking we know more about what we need. Tim has talked about this multiple times, and it's so true. It needs to be repeated. We think we know how it should be done. We know what we want, and if we don't get it when we want it, then we think, well, I guess it's up to me to do a little manipulating here and... And how many of you know that usually turns into a nightmare before it's all over with? 
We don't like waiting, but he says that's the only answer here is to wait on the Lord. Why? Because if you wait on the Lord, you're showing him you have faith in him. If you go ahead and try to do something on your own, you're going to get what you can produce. Amen? And so we are basically deifying ourselves. And it's wor worshiping a false image. Praise the Lord. Now, <laughs> hallelujah. 2 Thessalonians, look, look at this again. 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verses 3 through 5 again. Now, this could be scary if we didn't know the context in which it's written. But he says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. Now, there's not room in here for more than one God. Amen. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, why is that? Because he's the one that tempts us with all the distractions and everything else to think that we have an answer that God doesn't have, or that God's not going to answer it, so I've got to do something. This is Adam and Eve all over again, you know, in our lives constantly, right? And he says, that the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, Paul says. Remember, I, I warned you about this. All right? So Paul says, in another place, which we'll get to in here in a moment, he says, we were once these kind of people. But now, we've been given a new nature. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Verses 19 and 20. And what did the Spirit of God come to live in? He came to live in our spirit, which is in this physical shell, which he calls the, the temple. Amen. So what, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Chapter 7, verse 23. You are bought with a price. Be not ye, or be not ye the servants of men. <laughs> that says a lot to me. We've been purchased. Now, servants of men, he's not necessarily talking about the rest of the world. He's talking about me. Don't let my spirit become subject to me. It needs to be subject to God. If it's subject to me, I'm going to be making determinations and decisions based on circumstances that are natural instead of Spiritual. Instead of using faith, I'm going to use sense knowledge and natural knowledge that man has, that everybody has, the senses, right? And he's saying, you're bought with a price. You're not in that category anymore, so don't be a servant of your flesh. Don't let it rule. Don't let it dominate. Don't let it dictate. Trust in the God who has saved you. Amen? Who is in you. Who lives there. Amen? Amen? Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 13 through 23. Mark 7, 13 through 23. He says, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. He's talking about the religious people. And when he had called all the people unto himself, he said unto them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. In other words, they said, what in the world are you talking about? And he said, are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man can't defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart or into his spirit, but into his flesh. And goeth out, as we know how it goes out, amen, purging of meats, 
And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defiles the man. It's not what goes in, it's what goes out. Amen. For from within our out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So the outer or the natural person, amen, the flesh, is the question, am I the ruler of my destiny or is the Lord Jesus, amen, the inner? And that's the constant struggle that we have. I'm not saying we rationalize this any more than we do 90% of the other things we do. We just react. But I'm saying that is the conflict. Our natural mind, it doesn't grasp you know, this vastness and this love and this beauty and this perfection of God. Uh, we can focus on it. We can meditate on it. And it helps us to, to comprehend. But we never really completely get it. So when we get faced with a situation, the, the natural instinct is to let myself take over. Let my thought figure out how to work this out and why are they doing that and why is this like it is. Amen. Instead of the inner person. Amen. I resort to the outer person. Now, the outer person, it, it, it can't affect the inner person. I mean, it doesn't change my spirit, it doesn't, but it can affect the natural things that I'm confronted with. Because if I don't let the spirit deal with those natural things, they'll, they'll remain in the natural. They'll just remain whatever they are. This is the reason for confessing the word and so on and so forth. Because otherwise, if you don't understand that your words have power, amen, as authority, then you're going to say crap that's going to come back and haunt you, amen, without even knowing where it's coming from. When it came from you. Because it's from what comes out of the person that either defiles them or blesses them. Right? So, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Now, he's talking about the Word of God here. And he says, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Or plain faced, you know, not contrived or, or, or trying to be phony or, or whatever, but just open face, beholding us in a glass. In other words, just who I am. This is it. This is what I am, all right? So just like that, with that, just me, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord. So I can see the Lord even in this just human, right? And are changed then into the same image from glory to glory. What I see is me that I know, right? But beholding it by the Word of God, I get just my, I'm just saying, this is me, right? And then the more I look at the Word of God, the more I realize I've been changed into the image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. All right? So the mirror or the glass, amen, the Word of God, and he says, as we look in the mirror of God's Word, we are conformed. You know what that word means? I mean, we all use it all the time, and I don't know that I... I look up words a lot of times because I know I use them and don't even know for sure what the, what the hell I'm saying, praise the Lord. So I looked it up, and it actually means bringing into harmony or to become one, to be the same. Now, I mean conforming. You, know, you normally think, well, you just conform to the rules. You know, you just go along with it. But this is something much more powerful than, than that. He says we are being conformed to his image. Amen. And that, that, what that means is we are being made one. It's our, and not that we haven't been one, because we are when we get born again. But what happens is when we look in the Word of God and make that the focus, it begins to make a realization take place in us that we are one with God, that He is dwelling in me, that He is, amen, the source of my life and all that I have and all that I ever will have, amen. We are changed into the same image. We become one. We become integrated, amen, with God, amen interfacing, however you want to put it. The fact is that there's areas in all of our lives, and I'm not, you know, judging or, you know, critiquing or telling you I know something you don't think I know. That's not the point. The fact is there's areas in all of our lives that can be out of control at times. Things happening in our lives that are, Paul calls it the motions of sin. You know why that is? Because we can't sin. I mean, we can sin, but we're not sinners. So the motions of sin can be in my life, even though God doesn't see me as a sinner. Does that make sense to anybody? This is what's hard for people. They think you're a hypocrite because they see you walking out of a bar. 
Or maybe you had lunch there. I mean, there's, you get more food in bars anymore than you do in a restaurant. I mean, for, you know what I'm saying? Amen. You might have a beer or whatever, a glass of wine. That's not the point. I'm just saying people can think, okay, what a hypocrite. He claims that he's born again. He, he claims that his sins have been forgiven and he's the righteousness of God. Yes, and that's a fact. I'm not a sinner. I'm not. You think, wait a minute, I know you. I'm not a sinner. I can sin. The motions of sin can still be in me because I still have a flesh body. I still have a human body. But that doesn't make me a sinner anymore because I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord. Amen. I'm not a sinner. I do sin. I do, the motions are still there and I can react and respond and do things that are, you know, that's what we're all talking about here. But the problem is, if I start identifying with the motions rather than the reality, then I'm lost. I'm screwed up because I'm not ever going to get anything from God because I don't think I deserve it and He's not going to give it to me and I, I, you know, I did this thing or I said that thing or somebody knows that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Amen. The fact is, we all have problems. Amen. Everybody that's living on this planet has problems. Jesus said it. We're all going to have tribulations. Tim talked about it this morning. And, and we know that to be a fact. Nobody here sitting in this room today or listening over the internet or anything else doesn't have some crap, doesn't have some issues and some problems. Amen. Amen. If we're going to look at the facts, the facts are never going to set you free. The fact is, I look into that mirror with an open face. That's a fact. Right? But God is saying, that may be a fact, but if you'll stay with this, I'll show you the truth. Amen. You'll start to be conformed. You'll start recognizing, hey, I'm one here. I'm, I'm one with God. I'm not that thing that I'm looking at in the mirror. That thing that I'm looking at in the mirror has to conform to my true identity. Instead of us trying to conform to that, it has to conform to us. Amen? Amen? The Word says, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. That's why Jesus in another place talked about, I think it was Jesus, might have been, yeah, it was Jesus. He says, uh, you know, you're all freaking out here about what you're drinking, what you're eating, what days you're worshiping, when you go to church, when you don't go to church. He said, all that's just BS. It has nothing to do with what I'm trying to talk to you about. To one man, it's good to have a glass of wine. To another man, that's a horrible sin. And the truth is, it's true for both of them. The one who says, God's okay with this. Amen. He doesn't have any guilt about it or shame about it. And I'm not talking about uh, you know, affecting other people's lives or, or, or you know what I mean. But just to have a glass of wine or to have a beer or whatever it might be. To one person, that's, hey, it's, it's a given. It's okay. To another person, that is the most wicked thing in the world. And it's true for both of them. To one is sin, to the other it's not sin. Why? Because he said if it's not of faith, it's all sin. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, faith is an important thing because if you don't have faith, how are you going to know what you're supposed to do? If you don't have a confidence in yourself that, hey, God's okay with this. He's not angry with me about it. Then you're going to condemn yourself. And that condemnation will turn out to be just what, exactly what Don talked about here earlier. It will bring condemnation on everybody around you. Because if I'm guilty, everybody's going to be guilty. If I'm feeling bad about me, I guarantee you I'm going to make you feel bad about you before this is over with. I may not do that consciously. But I'll start projecting my own anxieties and my own fears and my own anger onto you. Right? Because misery loves company. That's not just a cliche, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So the truth is how it is in Christ. The fact is how it is in Adam. The fact is we all still screw up. The truth is we're not screw-ups. Amen? The fact is we all sin, but the truth is we're not sinners. Colossians 3 and 1. may seem, you know, just redundant. I'm just saying the same old stuff over and over. But I'm telling you how impressed God has made this to me. How much He has impressed it upon me. The importance of this and how it can free, us, free our lives. How that it can make us the people who really enjoy life. Who aren't living, wringing their hands from day to day over every circumstance and situation that comes up. Every seeming failure that we have becomes another weight, another burden, another reason that, oh, how am I going to do this? And how can I have faith for... I don't know how you can have faith for healing or for prosperity if you can't have faith to believe that God dwells in you, that God is there and that He loves you and that He'll never forsake you. We can say it. It's easy to say it. But we've got to believe it. We have to start living this way and start... Every time that thought comes, whoa, what a screw up. Shut up 
devil. Amen. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I have been received into the blood. I am good in every area of my life. God has blessed me. God loves me. He has told me that I am the, 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 uh, the lover of, of, of his. You know, I mean, he, he, he wants me. He comes after me like Hosea going after Gomer. You know, I talked about it a couple weeks ago. This prostitute's out screwing around and, and God says, go marry her. Whoa, you know, I take her out, but I, I don't know that I want to make any kind of lasting commitment here, right? But God says, no, go get her. He does. She has children by him, and then she goes back to prostitution. And God says, go get her. Now, when she's finally to the point where nobody wants her anymore, they're not willing to pay anything for her, he tells her, you go buy her down at the auction block where they're selling the prostitutes. And I said... It wasn't because God was trying to see how much he could humiliate Hosea or make his life miserable. It was God trying to show us what lengths he'll go to for each and every one of us. Because we're the, basically the, the whores that God comes and gets and then we run off and do our own thing. And, but he marries us over and over and over. He keeps coming back and seeking after us. And he saves us over and over. I know once saved, always saved. But the, the idea is that he saves me from myself every day. Amen. He comes and gets me and brings me back and says, whoa, reset here. You know, yeah. that's the love that God has for us. That's the image he wants us to understand. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. In spite of our behavior, you know, in spite of what we do, we're that important to God. I mean, if we could understand that, I, I don't know any guy in here, or woman for that matter, who would allow her husband or his wife to be like that, to do that. And we would still be with them. Now, we might feel bad and be hurt and disappointed and all that kind of stuff. But I don't, I mean, I'm not going back for more. You know, I mean, I mean who does that? Only God does that. Only a God who can see past. See, it wasn't for, for, for Gomer. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a bad behavior. It was a lifestyle. It was her. That was her personality. That was her nature. Right? That's us. It isn't like, you know, we just get up one day and I think I'm just going to be a jerk. No, you just get up one day and you are a jerk. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Doesn't take any real effort. Amen. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Amen? So we need to see the reality that we have been raised with Christ. We are seated with Him in heavenly places, in the temple. Amen? So he says, set your affections, or set your thoughts, amen, and your thinking on things above, or on the spiritual things and not on the natural things. Amen? Not on things of the earth, not on natural things, not on all this stuff. Don't let that be the distraction. Don't let it consume you. Look to Him. Look to God. Look to that relationship. Amen? Praise the Lord. Psalms 27, verse 5. Now again, I, I, I mentioned this when we first read it, but for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle shall he hide me. The real me is hidden in the temple, right? And he'll set me up upon a rock. Our lives, the scripture says, our lives are hid with Christ in God. And that's exactly what God is talking about here. He has hidden me in Christ, in God. I think it was John said, he must increase, I must decrease. I got to see more of him and less of me. And the more of him that I see and believe in, the more of him I receive. The more of the blessing of that relationship I get. The more it's about me, the more the struggles, the more the battles. Amen. Ephesians 1 verse 3. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, who hath blessed us. So, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, right here, it's already there. Amen? He's already done some stuff. In fact, he's already done everything. 
He has blessed us. John 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Amen? I will dwell in them, God said. And God wants to, again, fill his temple with his glory. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. That word reprobate just simply means unbelief, to be an unbeliever. He says, examine yourselves. I think he says, he, he's saying do this all the time. Every time something comes up, examine yourself, whether you're in the faith or not. What is the faith? I've been born again. By God's faith, by God's grace and favor, I am righteous. Examine yourself. Yourself, not the external, but your true self. Know you not your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you? You got to know this, he said, unless you're, not, unless you're an unbeliever, unless you don't believe. So we all need to really know ourselves as the temple of God. Paul says here, stop. He said, stop and think about it. Take in this awesome truth, the power of new life. He makes all things new. You are a new creation. You are a God man, a God woman. If you want the power of this life, then you have to believe in and accept the, un the indwelling. Amen? Galatians 2.20. So we can see some more things. He said, I'm, uh, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what's he saying? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, Yet it's not I, but it's Christ living in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise the Lord. So, the reason he lives in you, the reason he lives in me, is to breathe his own likeness into us. Amen? The one who's dead here is Adam. The old nature. The old identity. Amen? Amen? We are alive in Christ. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13, 4. And I want to take this thought a little bit further here. He says, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. So what I just said is this. It wasn't just Christ living in him. This is what Paul's trying to explain. It wasn't like he's just here, dormant. You know, he's just there, period. But he's there acting, speaking through him, doing what Paul couldn't do, amen, conforming us to his image. The reason he's there is not just to give us a ticket to heaven. The reason he's there is because God's wanting to work through us. He's wanting to be his image to be in us so that he can do everything he ever did through you and me. Amen? Through us. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Again, the, this idea of faith. It's, it's insane to think that we're going to follow Christ or imitate Christ by our own effort, by what we are able to do. That's why this consciousness has to be there, because God, that's how God does it. He does it, but He does it through us. We don't do it. We don't discipline ourselves to where the point where we can do this thing. We get our head and body wired together so that we can do the things that God wants to do through this body. 
Amen. We get our spirit and our flesh in tune. Amen. Now you say in the Marine Corps, get your head and wired together or you're not going to get anything accomplished here. You're going to end up blowing yourself up or somebody else. So that's the idea here is to make that connection that you and God are one now. This isn't about your natural man. This is about you being subjected to the Spirit so that the Spirit can then work through you. So that God has a voice. So that God has hands and feet and so on and so forth. A heart. Amen. To love. Amen. So by grace are we saved through faith. Not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Amen. Trust Him. And He's going to do His work in us and through us in His way. Not in our way. Abraham thought he knew how to do this. God said, no, this isn't the plan. The plan is you're going to have a child, but I'm the one that's going to bring this child, not you. I'm going to bring it through you, but it's going to be me that does it. Amen? So that's the, that's the thing he's trying to get us to understand. God wants us to have all these things, but we can't get them. We don't have the ability to do it. We have to allow him to do it through us, and that's how the word of God comes in. Amen? Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. So he's, this is what he's actually talking about, what I just said. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of his everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And it's not you doing it. It's him working through you, right? And the only way that can happen through Jesus, God works in you, amen, and, and that only way it happens is by Jesus being in you. By you being one with Him. Amen? Know your own selves. Know you not your own selves that Jesus Christ is in you. Amen? At this, this supernatural life comes to us and through us as we believe. Amen? It, doesn't, it just doesn't happen automatically. I mean, we get born again. We get saved just simply by faith. And then everything else after that works by the same principle. So if you don't exercise faith in this re relationship that we have, you, you, you'd be better off dead. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You, you'd already be in heaven. You'd, be, you'd escape the crap that's here in this world. But since we're not escaping it, then we ought to do something about disconnecting from it, not allowing it to dominate. Amen? I mean, I... I need air to breathe. I need it every minute of my life. Every, every minute I'm here on this planet, I need air. I need oxygen. Amen? And the scripture says God is breath to our spirit. I need God every minute that I'm on this planet as well for my spirit. For it to be healthy like a healthy body is if it's getting good, clean, fresh air, I need the same thing for my spirit. Amen? Exodus, well, I, I won't go there for the sake of time, but in Exodus, you know the story about the manna that come down from heaven to the people of Israel. And they didn't like it. They said, well, I don't, I'm sick of this light bread. Give us some meat. You know, <laughs> give us something. This stuff is boring. We don't understand what it is and why it is. But, you know, the deal with the manna was, if you didn't eat it the day you picked it or the day you gathered it, it was corrupt by the next day. It was rotten. It was inedible. Amen? And so, I need fresh grace every day. I need to be aware. Because it's easy to, you know, get into a funk where you're doing something stupid and you forget that. And for a couple of days, then you're miserable and you're trying to get your act together again. I need fresh grace. I need it every day. I don't need to necessarily understand it completely. I don't have to have a deep understanding theologically and all that. I just need to know that it's there, it's available, and it's for me every single day. His, his blessings are new every morning, right? His, his goodness is good for every day, and we need to be aware of that, amen? Every day. And it comes by faith in Christ every day. Israel despised the light bread. In other words... They didn't really care one way or another. They weren't crazy about it. It's better than nothing, but it isn't really what I want, right? I'd rather have something substantial, amen? But Jesus said, I am the true bread. I am the manna that your fathers rejected, amen? I am that manna from heaven. So I'm saying today, accept 
and value, amen, believe in your place in Christ. Believe where you are seated, who you are seated with, amen, that He's in you. And it'll give you boldness. It'll give you courage to do the things that we hesitate to do otherwise because we're a little shy or timid or afraid of being embarrassed or whatever it might be. Amen? Life in Christ. You know, in the temple, this has been interesting too, you know, uh, there's two tables of shoe bread or manna is basically what it represented. And the priests ate that while they were working in the temple on their way to the veil. Amen. As they went about their priestly duties, there was the, the candlestick, you know, the light and so on and so forth. And there was the shoe bread that they would, that was the only food they ate while they were in their uh, temple duty. And that sustained them to get to the veil where they would offer up atonement, you know, once a year beyond the veil. They'd go in beyond the veil. Amen. So I, th I think that's kind of interesting in Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verse 19. You remember, Jesus said, I am the true bread. So in Hebrews uh, chapter 6 and verse 19, he says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Mm -hmm. That anchor is Jesus. That's what, he's, what they're talking about. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The soul is not your spirit. The soul is your intellect. It's your thinking. It's your... You know, your personality, that kind of stuff. Amen. And which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. In other words, to connect the soul, to get your thinking and your spirit on the same page. Amen. Steadfast, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil. Amen. So, in Christ, we are within the veil. We are seated with Him in heavenly places. That was the heavenly place on earth. Amen. And we have been given access through Christ to come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. This Jesus is a living person. You're going to see Him in the flesh, in a body. Praise the Lord. Amen. And He loves you personally as a person loves a person. Only love that's beyond our understanding as human beings. Amen. He looks every day for a personal response from you. Amen. So the presence of God with Israel was the mark of their separation from other people, from the people who God was not interacting with. Amen? We are constantly, all of us, are being invited to live every minute of our lives in this intimacy with Jesus, in this intimacy with God, accepted, loving, just like we were talking about with the grandchildren and the children, and just enjoying it. And enjoying them enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? What can I get? The boys are saying, uh, uh, Colt was saying, uh, you really like football, don't you, Popo? And I said, yeah, I like football. And he said, you know they got football cards at Walmart? <laughs> I really like football cards. He said, I'm really into football. <laughs> hey, I get it. You know, you don't have to hit me with a hammer. <laughs> Amen? You know what? I'll get the biggest kick out of going to Walmart and finding football cards. Why? Because I know he's going to get a kick out of it when I give them to him. It's no big deal. I mean, you know what I'm saying? But to him it's a big deal. And so it becomes a big deal to me. Yep. I, love to, I like to do that, you know. And I'm just a guy. And, and the, the scripture says, you know, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more does your heavenly father want to give you the Holy Ghost or to give you his spirit? I mean, I, it excites me to think that God cares about me the way I care about them. That's the only way I can relate to it. But I know that actually his love for me so supersedes anything that I can, you know, show. But he wants me to have him. And that's what we're really doing. We want them to have us. You know, we want them to have something of us because... Well, we're not going to be here forever, right? I mean, we'll be with them again, but we're not going to be here forever. But I'd like there to be something that they go, you know, Pope was a pretty good guy. You know, he was kind of a jerk, but he was a good guy. You know, he, you know, he, he showed love, right? And that's, what more can you ask for, really? Amen? The veil is torn in two, and we have access into the Holy of Holies. 
And it's by the blood of Jesus. Into the very presence of God. The presence with us, in us, wherever we go. Whatever we do. All things are yours, he said. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Whatever you ask in my name or in my place, I'll do it. Football cards? Got it. Covered. Amen? I mean, I know I simplify things but because I'm a little simple. But I'm saying, this is how God's wanting us to understand him. He wants us to understand him the way we understand the people that we love the most, the people that we're connected with. He wants us, he uses our life to explain himself, to show us him and how he wants this relationship with us. You know, in the, the story of the prodigal son, I was looking at this uh, last night, in fact, and it says the, the prodigal's brother, now if you take it in the context of what, you know, where my mind's at right at this moment, what God was dealing with me, the prodigal son is the spirit, the inner spirit, right? Because he comes to himself. He realizes, hey, my God, my dad's always good. I mean, the worst that could ever happen is he'd just hire me back as an employee, but he's not going to kick me out. He's not going to run me off, even though I've taken advantage of him and ripped him off and took his, the stuff that I shouldn't have taken and used it the way I shouldn't have used it. If I go back, he'll, he'll take me back, right? But the older brother is the flesh. He's kind of like the outer yeah. us, amen? So he, he, the older brother, the outer flesh thing, he says, well, you gave him... Uh, a fatted calf, you never even gave me a goat. I mean, he's bitter because, you know, why is he getting this stuff and I didn't get it? Why, why is he getting blessed and I'm not getting blessed? Why? And the scripture goes on to say, because you didn't ask. He said, everything I got's yours. It was always yours, the same as it was his. But you never asked me. He asked for his and I gave it to him and away he went and blew it and did the stupid stuff with it. If you'd asked, you'd have had yours too. And you'd be coming back and we'd be having a fatted calf for you as well. Amen. God is able to make all grace abound toward us. Yeah. Amen. God says, all that I have, it's yours. I gave it to you in Christ. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Again, we've read this several times, but it just simply means... Lest you be reprobate, he says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. See, this is the problem with the older brother. He wasn't examining himself. He was examining the circumstances that were going on around him, and he thought he's being slighted. I'm not getting mine. Why? Because you didn't ask. You didn't have faith to believe. And because you didn't believe, it's the same as being reprobate. You don't get anything. Amen? Examine you. That's what the younger brother did. He examined himself. He screwed it all up. He, he blew the money on the, and things that he shouldn't have done and, and uh, all sorts of things. Motions of sin were involved here. Amen. But he came to himself. He examined himself one day and said, whoa, this is stupid. Dad's got it all and he wants me to have it. He, he's, he, he's willing to share it. I'm going home. Amen. And that's the problem with the older brother. He never took the time to examine his relationship and how this really plays out. And, it, and basically it becomes a reprobate or an unbeliever in the love and the goodness of his father. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Again, we've read this one, but I'm, I'm wrapping up here. We'll be done just about. So he says, we all with open face... Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, remember I said when I think about this, I think of the, the, the fate, open face is just me looking in the mirror and seeing me, my flesh, my natural person. Not seeing myself spiritually, but seeing myself just as I am, right? And he says, so we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed or conformed to become one with him. Amen. The word face here is the Genesis face. That's how it's literally translated. Meaning, the face of his birth. So when I look in here, I'm seeing the face of my birth, right? But here's what God's trying to get us to understand. It's supposed to be specifically my new birth. That's why I need the Word of God. I'm looking in here and I'm seeing my birth face. I'm seeing my 1948, February 23rd 
face, right? And God is saying, I want you to see your new birth face, your Genesis faith face. Amen. And the only way to do that is by the word of God, by looking into the mirror of God's word, by believing what he says about this face more than what I believe when I look in the mirror. Amen. We look in the word of God and we see who we are in our new birth. That's the idea of the word of God. To conform us to his image, to make us one. Amen. That's the difference between walking in truth and walking in facts. The fact is, that's me. When I look in the mirror, the truth is there's something far more than what I'm looking at. Amen. Amen. We see what's happening around us and we forget what the word says about us. Yeah. We'll close with this. Psalms 27 and verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Verse 8. When thou saidest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Our Genesis face. It's hidden in this tabernacle. Amen? And we need to see it. We need to see it every day in order for others to see it. For this to be the reality that God wants us to be. For us to be everything that he wants us to be. For us to reach our, in our full potential as children of God. We have to do this. And it isn't just so we can do stuff for God. It's so that we can be free. So that we can have the joy, the experience of, of life that God wants us to have. And so that we can give back to God the love that he put us here for in the first place. God wants love too. He is love. But he wants that same interaction that we want with our children and grandchildren and so forth. We are his children, his offspring. And he wants that same kind of relationship. And the more we share it with him, the more he wants to do for us. I'm using human understanding here because but, but, he wants to do everything. He's already done everything for us. But I'm saying the access to that is by us embracing him and loving him and seeing ourselves as he sees us. Make sense? Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I smell soup. Glory to God. Let's go down and get something to eat. Hallelujah. Y'all dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless y'all.